thank you all again. Uh, I'm going to shoot this over to Nussi for some quick ground rules, and then we're going to jump right into this. Yes. Um, so thank you for those of you joining us here tonight. Um, you know, this is a very different way of going about things, but I do actually think we get to have more open and honest dialogues through this forum since we are really um, super connected in the type forum. So as for those of you who have not been to our one-on-one -on -one in person um, conversations or any of our previous um, Zoom meetings, we do just have a very few simple um, ground rules. One of them being is respect, right? We're gonna have people here who have different perspectives and different opinions around different topics. Um, and if you feel differently, that's fine. Um, you may learn something new, you may not. Um, it's really an opportunity just to like show respect, right? So even if you were disagree with anything that's being said, let's treat anyone that's speaking with respect, we let them finish. Um, the other rule is that everyone has a perspective, right? So everyone here, we do have two guests with us today and they are going to be speaking, but we will also allow after we ask them a few questions for you guys as well to jump in and ask any questions you may have. And then they'll be going into a general dialogue, one-on-one um, -on -one dialogue. Well, it's not one-on-one. -on -one. We'll have a group dialogue between all of us here tonight. Um, so a few weeks ago when we were working on, trying to figure out how we were going to be moving forward with everything, um, we really, we're trying to figure out what topics it was that we were going to cover, right? What we kind of had planned before is not um, no longer so applicable or it's not so relevant at this current time. And, you know, Jarell and I are both from Queens, New York, and we're kind of like in the epicenter of where everything is really going down. I mean, it's really happening everywhere right now. It is worldwide, but um, it does hit very close to home for us. Um, about a week and a half ago, I had someone reach out to me who wanted to speak um, to non-traditional media to really spread the message of why people should be staying home and like how they should really, um, what they really should be doing and right, like what it really means when people don't listen to the advice and the warning, warnings that are out there. Um, and they came to me anonymously. Um, they are on the call with us here tonight. Um, which is Dr. H. Um, it's kind of, for me personally, bothersome. We've had a few conversations now. We've had conversations with teachers and other essential workers. And there's been this general fear of people having, not being able to speak up or say what's really happening to them or what's affecting them. And so we are aware that um, there might be some restrictions. He's not able to share his space with us. He's not able to share um, his name or anything like that with us, but we do know that he has a perspective and he definitely has something very important to share. Um, we also have with us tonight Christina Tong, and I, you know, I know Jarrell called you something. I'm like, what do you, what am I supposed to call her? Um, so you, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves in a second um, properly, but we also, she's an uh, RN in LA, and she's also in the middle of the front line. She's really in there, and I know. She definitely has a lot of things to share with us as well. So we are really excited to have them with us here tonight. And we're going to get started. Um, I'm going to unmute you, Dr. H. And Achi, are you? Yes. And if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you here, what made you decide to speak with us today? Sure, who wants to go first? Uh, should I go first or? You can go first. Yeah, so um, I, I'm an internal medicine doctor at uh, Queens Hospital. And um, I, I have been working uh, probably for about like two or three years since uh, residency. Uh, but uh, I've always been in New York City. I grew up in New York City. Uh, so it's, it's very uh, close to my heart, you know, with the, the current situation. Uh, in New York, and uh, what what I wanted to convey was just that the the way that this thing spreads and the way that it's it's affected people is is far beyond like anything we can imagine from before. I mean, the way I I kind of uh, convey it to some of my friends is like if if the flu 
and a cold had a baby. It'd be like this disease, except that it it doesn't affect us the same way as, as the as the flu, because the the target for the virus is it's like deep within the lungs, and uh, people get all kinds of symptoms and it's it's scary and and you know they end up in the hospital and a lot of people think that it it only affects older people with comorbidities and but that's not the case. It's it's ended up that there's a lot of patients that come with no medical problems, no medical history, who are on the younger side, to, you know, anywhere from the mid twenties to forties, uh, and they can they get varying levels of disease. Some people get very sick, some people are mildly ill, but um, it's really it's a lot of it is is like unknown why one person will get it one way versus uh, the other way. And uh, for me, though, um, the saddest part is to see just like how much it's how quickly and how much it's it's affecting uh patients lives like uh the other day there was a man who like a uh, older guy in his like 60s he came to the hospital short of breath uh fevers chills body aches um and he he had just his wife had just passed away from the coronavirus um maybe like two or three days ago and here he was in the hospital uh, severely ill and it just it, to see these these patients and, you know, we don't let visitors come see them just because they can also then transmit it to other people outside. Uh, it's it's tough. It's, it's hard uh, to see that. And uh, but we have to have that. That humanity in that setting and, and kind of do whatever we can to make them feel better. A lot of nurses go around with. Um, uh their phones or like iPads and they try to like video chat their families so they could feel better. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, I think what I would have to say to start. Thank you. We appreciate you taking the time out to even speak with us tonight. Cause we know that it's definitely a lot while you're at work and I'm sure while you're home, even taking that time for some self care might be limited. Yeah, actually I've been, self quarantining myself. I haven't I've got three kids. They're small. Um one is four years old. Uh, I haven't seen them in three or four weeks because uh, I don't want them to get infected or my wife to get infected. And uh it's just, you know, I haven't even been able to hug them. I just I see them from far away and I keep my distance and it's such an unnatural thing to keep distance. Yeah. But it's necessary. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. H. And um, just to jump in there, that just from my perspective of how crazy that is, is that um, when we did this with the teachers, we also got the same kind of request for you. So don't think your request is crazy. We actually have people in the school system who were like, hey, can we talk anonymously because of the ramifications of something said. So that's an interesting thing for us to all look at. You know, we, we love the freedom here in America and then something like this happens and we have certain doctors and certain people who are like, nah, I don't want to come out. So thank you, thank you. Thank you for even being here with us. Um, Absolutely. Christina? Hi, um, so I'm a registered nurse in um, LA right now. Um, so I, I mainly work in the procedural areas. So I do PACU, which is post-anesthesia care unit. Um, so I recover patients out of surgery. Uh, since the coronavirus has ha happened, um, you know, surgeries, elective surgeries has dwindled down to zero. Um, a lot of the surgeons have canceled everything just because, you know, it's, that's the safest thing possible. And it's just a lot of emergent cases um, that we're just doing. So anything that's emergency or that's like must need is what we do. Um, and that being said, uh, we, our staff has for and has me as well have been deployed to other areas. Um, I've been in ICU. I was in ICU this week for the first time ever. And it's a very, very sad situation. Um, you know, there's, 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 everybody is, you know, intubated. Um, and the settings for vent, uh, you know, not getting all specific about it, but it's, it's totally different. It's a different type of beast. Like you can't, you can't solve it with just the regular things that we usually would do. 
and everybody is, they have the same classic symptoms and signs and, you know, you're doing the best that you can. And it's just like, it's just hoping for the best. People are being like, like laid, like face down to try to see if that helps with them. Um, you know, the good side is that there are people that recovered. I saw one patient leave the ICU and was able to be downgraded. But then again, then I saw two people die that same day. And it's a very sad situation because it's like, you know, people are dying by themselves. Like they, the only buys that they can say, it, their family members that can say is through FaceTime. And most of these people that are like saying bye, they're sedated, they're intubated or, you know, are brain dead. And they're not able to have that human, like physical connection. And then this person is passing away by themselves. And it's a, it's a very, very, very sad situation in, in, that, in that sense, just, you know, human side being a nurse and then being a person, just having to know that your family member is passing away by themselves. Um, I, mean, I think California has done their due diligence in the stay at home orders. So I think this, this week and next week is probably the week that we're trying to see if we're gonna surge, but we, I haven't seen a surge yet at my hospital and, I, and across everywhere else. I think they're like kind of just kind of like tapered down. So that's a good thing. Um, but still, you know, there's a bunch of people that are, are fighting. They're like, like the doctor said, you know, it doesn't, it's not just old people. There's young people like with no symptoms, no, no, like no health history. And they're, they're fighting for their lives right now. So, wow, wow, that's um, that's everything. Um, that's very powerful. And what I heard from both of both of you in that sense was a, a level of humanity. You know, um, where it's you know it's people are passing, and we know that people are passing. And I'm sure in your field, you're used to it more than the average person seeing people transition and, and die. But um, the 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 small the, the not so small things of course but having family actually there you know mm -hmm. um uh, as the doctor mentioned and i i'm i talked with christina on a personal conversation of seeing people going around with ipads and facetime you know could you imagine your nurse facetiming your family to you on your deathbed you know that's the kind of stuff that that we're dealing with here <clears throat> And that's uh, unfortunately not just for a lot of the patients, it's not, excuse me, not just the COVID-19 patients, but a lot of people who are, are just sick and passing in the hospital and people can't come up, you know? Um, so that, that's amazing. I guess with saying that, jumping right into the next question, um, there, there were many questions we thought about asking both of you and, and uh, the experience and what you saw, but I guess for right here, what has what has like changed the most? Uh, what would you say has changed in the way that you work, uh, the, the way that you do your job? Uh, what has changed? If you've been used to seeing a certain amount of death and a certain amount of chaos, what's the difference between before and now? So, um it's it's like for me it we did have a period during the flu season where it was we had it was the hospital was packed it was like full we were trying to redirect patients to another hospital because of how full it was but people still walk into the er and we have to take those patients uh regardless of our capacity now what where we're at right now is like almost double of that so we have like all these patients and and they're all in varying degrees of sickness and some of the things that we typically would do for someone who has a breathing problem we, we can't do now because it actually spreads the virus into the air so in between like a, a regular nose nasal cannula oxygen there's also like a mask but we also had we used to have bipap we would use that which is like a, a mask that applies pressure as well as something else called high flow nasal cannula, which is just kind of like a, a much uh, larger quantity of oxygen that we could deliver. But those things aerosolize the virus and making it very risky for 
people in the in the working area uh, to get it. Um, so now yeah. we have to have either a mask or the vent, and it's it's a lot of people are hanging very much in between. Um, and and vent doesn't necessarily mean it, it it'll lead to a good outcome. Many of the vent patients don't do well um, and do end up passing. So for me, uh, just just seeing the the volume and kind of the way we practice is is being affected, and also just there's a certain degree of um, helplessness on on our part where we can't, you know, because it's a virus and because there's no clear treatment. I know Doctor um, not Doctor <laughs> Mr. Trump is uh, uh, <laughs> promoting. <laughs> yeah, not a doctor. Um, <laughs> Is promoting uh, hydroxychloroquine, and we tried it. You know, we tried it on on every patient. Uh, hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin. I've had patients demand it, and uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't affect everyone. Some people it does help, but like it's it's we're finding more and more that it's not an effective drug, and uh, it's that's that's the worst part for me. That it's, there's just this degree of helplessness, and I I have to. When I talk to the patient, they're like, you know, so what are we going to do? You know, what what are you going to do for me, doc? And I just I just have to tell them, well, we're going to keep a close eye on you, monitor you, and uh, you know, we'll make sure all of your labs are okay and all that stuff. All your electrolytes are properly hydrated. But you know, beyond that, uh, and oxygen support, which is the main main reason why these patients are coming to the hospital, there isn't much else we can offer. And and the sheer quantity of these patients, because the 20 percent of the infected people will come to the hospital, so that's like a huge amount of uh, people. If you think about the population of New York City, which um, I'm not sure exactly, it's like 60 million or something like that. So 20 percent of of that would be, you know, like an astronomical number. Mm-hmm. Now, but at this point, because of the quarantine measures, there there's not not a hundred percent of the population is infected. So as long as those measures stay in place and we're starting to see the benefits of the quarantine measures when they started like three weeks ago. Um, and now there's less and less patients coming in, but if they do dial back on that and then the other part of the population that wasn't infected, 20% of those people come in, then again, we'll have a huge surge of patients and a huge, like overwhelming amount of patients and the people taking care of them. They, we have the regular hospital doctors, but we have, we're pulling cardiologists, we're pulling other specialists that normally don't take care of inpatient. I mean, you know, they have their field that they specialize in, in cardiology. They do their regular thing, but we're pulling them every single doctor we can to take care of the, the volume of patients that we have. The other thing is just safety, you know, concern about, you know, do I have, the right equipment to protect me? Am I going to get sick? Did I get sick already? There's a lot of questions there that, that um, in our day-to-day practice, um, we, we have to take into account in, in how we do things and be very vigilant about the way we, we interact with patients and, and, and all that, because we don't know, this is a highly, highly contagious uh, virus. I, I've had um, some nurses that work in the in in one of the units where I mean basically the whole hospital now is like a unit for all these patients. But this was earlier on, and she she didn't have any goggles or anything, um, but she she was just you know in the halls essentially, and she thinks she may have just gotten it like that from like you know something entering her eye, and you know it caused her. Uh, severe symptoms and she needed oxygen for some time, but then she did get better. Most patients do get better, but uh, the scary part is that we don't know who will get very sick and who will get mildly sick. So what's that's, the quality that's what's... of people coming in? If it, you know, remains at this pace of, or if let's say a hundred percent of the population does become affected, right? And there's a, there's more people coming into the hospital system as they're preparing for, um, as you started mentioning, there are certain ethical issues that start coming into play. Have there, is there anything um, that has been discussed 
in the hospital system or amongst doctors about, um, and either one of you can answer this, right, about who gets some kind of treatment or who doesn't get some kind of treatment. Like at what point, how long do you, will you spend to resuscitate someone? Or do you still not do that? Like I think if you have a heart attack now, they no longer bring you to the hospital from what I believe I last saw, but it may have changed since then. Um, are there any other ethical issues or things that have come up while working? Yeah, on? absolutely. There's so many ethical issues actually, because the thing is we, we can tell who's going to get, you know, very sick and we can tell from the way that it progresses, like kind of like the speed at which they become more and more sick and kind of where their vital signs are. Um, normally, uh, we would intubate someone if their oxygen went below 90. 100% is like, you know, ideal. Someone like perfectly healthy will be at 100%. But yeah, normally like it would be like, if it was like under 90, we would start thinking about intubation, try those other things that I mentioned, BiPAP, high flow, nasal cannula. But in this case, we're, because we don't have the vents, we don't have the staff, even the ICU staff to support these vented patients because ICU nurses are, they have special training um, and they have a special understanding of how these patients should be monitored and the medications that need adjustments frequently, uh, things like that. Um, so because of that, we're letting them have like a lower oxygen and we're watching them and, and they do some people, most people do okay, but you know, some people, we'll have to emergently intubate them when they get to a more critical level. Um, and also patients who are are older, like a 96-year-old, 90-year-old person uh, with so many medical problems, will they get as much attention? We'll try, but in, in the back of our minds, I think we know what what may come of it. And I don't know if it's I don't think there's a, a conscious bias, but, and me personally, I try to stay very vigilant of any kind of bias that I have in treating my patients. But, you know, sometimes other doctors may have a, a bias against those kinds of patients because we know that we have limited resources and we don't know how to spend them all appropriately because we, we know that, you know what I'm saying? Like how... Okay what a difference it is between someone who has lived their entire life versus someone who's like a 25 year old and he's on the brink of death. And he's, you know what I'm saying? It's, but you, again, like how can anyone decide that? Nobody can decide that, but it's become kind of like a wartime situation where uh, decisions are being made based on viability right. and priorities are given based on that. I understand. Christina, um, did you want to add something to that? Is it the same? Yeah. Um, things that are different from like then and now is, I think like the whole process of just protection um, while in the hospital has changed on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, from the beginning, like the CDC was like, oh, it's, it's a contact, um, a contact virus. You know, a week later, it's, it's a respiratory virus. And then a day later, it's like, no, like everything constantly changes. So, you know, for, for me as a nurse, <clears throat> trying, you know, being at a hospital and taking care of patients, you know, not only are we protecting ourselves, but we're protecting the other patients too, whatever is happening. And it's really, really difficult to do that with um, just not having the adequate information. Uh, for me, like, I work in a very structured chaos, like, I thrive in structured chaos, but this is just a very chaotic time where there's really not enough information that we can receive as a healthcare provider or even the public, and everything changes. So it's just kind of like this, like, limbo of trying to figure out what's going, what's next. Um, so that's what's different. Um, uh, Patrick asked a question about PPE. Uh, with my hospital, we received a lot of PPE, which is great. But what I've found out was they prioritize the PPE. So all, like mostly all our PPE goes to our ICU. 
We have um, this thing called PAPR, which is a positive air. I can't remember the other things, but it's basically a N95, but you don't have to wear a mask and it protects you 99%. Um, and they only go to ICU, um, mostly because they're intubated and everybody is on um, other things. So they protect, protect the ICU nurses. But um, recently, I think this week, um, a, a unit walked out because they did not have enough PPE because they were not protected and they had then they were doing it with COVID. So it's kind of, it varies. It's like, do we have enough PPE? Yes. But is the hospital or whoever is prioritizing it? Yes. So I mean, for me, I just last week just started wearing a mask because the CDC recommended it. Not because it was like something that we need to protect or like, you know, the hospital's like, well, we don't have enough masks. So you either have provide your own or you don't have to wear one. So, but now it's like, it's required, you have to wear a mask. So it's just like these kind of levels, like, you know, in the end, hospitals are a business. It's still a business and like, they have to find a way to cut corners and save money. And I'm, I'm gonna say it that way because I've seen it in that sense. And it sucks because it's like, yeah, we are people and we have to be compassionate and we have to figure out how to protect everybody but at the same time, this is like sometimes it's it's a business, and businesses are, you know, we you know evil in some sort. You got to figure out a way to find things to do. It's, you're the first person to um, not that I've heard that, but during this time to make that a thing. Uh, you know that this is still a business. You know, at, at times like this, we all get to a very compassionate place, and we're like the hospital is just opening their doors to everyone and. And that goes along the lines of what Nussie just asked as far as ethics, because we've heard a lot of different stories about what that looks like. Um, and, you know, no one's really saying that, that a lot of America runs off business. All of our companies that really should be humanitarian based or for the people are really business based, you know, and then that trickles all the way down to the nurses, to the doctors who have to tell the, the patients and the family oh, we can't do this because of business or, you know, such and such got sick because we didn't have enough material because of business, you know? Um, and touching on that, what we also like to, well, what we also like to do, what we like to do here at Iron Perspective, I think we treat this as family, everybody who jumps on our show, we want to talk with you and not at you. So we want to thank both of you for what you've given us thus far, very medical answers. And now we're asking you personally, like, how are you doing? How is this is a mental health check-in for Christina and Dr. H. Uh, I know you guys have just touched on it and the chaos and, and, and things. Yeah, you like mentioned that. everything that's happening and, you know, we could probably assume how that might be making you guys feel, but really just asking you because I don't know how often you guys have the opportunity to really like check in around that because of the work that you guys are doing. So how has your mental health been? Um, I, I can start. Uh, it's, it, it waxes and wings for me. Uh, it really depends on the energy out there. Um, the first two weeks was energy was just crazy. It was a lot of state of panic and I absorbed that. So it's just, it was just a lot of like going home, like trying to figure out like how I'm going to get so go to work the next day and deal with people. Cause also I was, um, I'm also a charge nurse. So I'm not only looking and caring for patients, I'm also caring for my staff. So I'm making sure that the staff is okay. And you know, the staff is scared. Like, you know, um, some of my staff was pregnant. They're now in medical leave because they, they want to protect their unborn child, you know, and also we have to protect the older nurses, you know, the, the ones that are like, they've been a nurse for like 30 years. You don't want to put them into ICU. So it's just a lot of just like, a lot of just like making sure everybody is okay. And so, you know, I go home sometimes and I'm just drained, drained out of my mind. And this is like, this is, sucks, but you know, um, especially, especially when someone dies, it's a, it's a sucky situation, you know. Um, I don't think, even if you're not connected, even if you, never, if you just had them for like an hour or two, there's still some kind of connection. And you know, as a nurse, you always want to save everybody. And it sucks when you can't do anything to save that person. And you kind of just, you know, play the what ifs games. So it's a very, it's a very hard situation. Um, I think I'm 
I have I have a great support system. So you know they they hear me vent, and you know I go go to work the next day and just cope with it. And tequila. I'm <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to leave that out or if we were going to get a real answer. <laughs> the is the best thing ever. <laughs> Dr. H? Yeah, so... Uh, oh, just uh, one thing I wanted to address, though, about um, it being a business. I, it's The other thing is... I know, like, this is going back, but uh, just real quick... Uh, I think the hospital systems are just not designed to accommodate this many patients. And that's where we get into these kinds of bottlenecks where some patients may, it's not like always just business, but like, it's just, we never have so many ill people at the same time. And, and, and that's just maybe like a failing of the medical system as a whole. Um, but yeah, just uh, as far as like well being goes, um, I do have to say, like, I'm very grateful for, the place that I work at, they support our, our well-being. They get, they turned all the like family visitation rooms into like uh, healthcare like relaxation rooms, and they have like snacks there. They they try to support us as much as they can in that way. Um, but also, I think just part of being a physician is that you have to either kind of cope with it or just kind of numb yourself for a moment. Uh, while well, you're in the middle of things and, and, and people are dying left and right. Um, just because like about every half hour we're having a code called, which means that someone goes into like cardiac arrest or cardiac pulmonary arrest, like heart lung failure, and uh, they need CPR. So this is happening every half hour. And many times um, they, they don't make it. But there's a certain, uh, you just, I don't know. I don't know if like you, you process it at the same time or or not but it's 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 frustrating and i think to some extent i think the best way to deal with it is to be a little bit numb and then you know you you get your time off to to think about it and process it in your own way yeah. but uh yeah i mean it's it's just uh it's an overwhelming situation and I think first and foremost, it has to be dealt with. And I think that's kind of the attitude probably that's going to be of most healthcare professionals uh, coming out of it that, or in the midst of it now, that they're just going to have to suck it up, so to speak, and, and deal with it and take care of it, handle it first. Because it is really like a wartime situation where we we can't, there's nothing we can do to control the situation. We've lost control of the situation and there's just an onslaught of sick people coming into the hospital and and we just have to do it. You know what I'm saying? There's a shortage of staff and just um, speaking to a uh, shortage of staff um, and it's like a wartime situation. So during our conversation last week, we had a discussion around uh, my personal feeling is that this is like wartime and that, you know, um, there are certain people that are currently on the front lines, which is, you know, obviously you guys, the medical professionals, we have our other essential workers as well. Um, but I do have that concern, the underlying concern of like, first of all, how long can you guys keep this up at this rate, like before you guys go into burnout? And well, what does that look like for the rest of us who are able to, you know, I, I understand the message of stay home, um, and that's the best possible thing that we can all be, you know, we should be doing if we're, we don't need to be out there. But um, what would support look like in the coming time, like let's say weeks, months from now, from the general population? Um, I recently just saw, I think a little bit earlier today, there was a ad out, they're looking for clerical support in the hospital system, right? Um, so maybe like not in a medical support, but like what does support, what would support look like in a more concrete sense than just sitting at home? How can people? And just before before you yeah. ask that, Dr. H, uh, we are gonna be asking a uh, asking a few questions from some of the folks in the room as well. So mm -hmm. what we're gonna ask sure. is if you have a question, throw it in the comments now, and uh, yeah. we'll we'll get uh, we'll get into the doctor and nurse Christina. So. <clears throat> yeah. 
I would say that um, my, the community around the hospital has been very supportive. Like a lot of the restaurants have provided meals, like like twice two meals a day to to the hospital staff. And you know, it, it was a it's a good thing because they're able to staff their restaurants and they're able to feed us, and and that's been great because you know the only the only, one of the things like you know how are we able to go food shop, food meal prep, whatever, and like they're like, oh hey, here's some food, like go ahead, you know, like we want to support you. So a lot of the like small businesses has been helping with that, where they're just like they support us with like things like food, or you know. Um, I think uh, some people brought some masks in, like they're like, oh, we have a bunch of masks or gowns. So that's been very supportive. Um, for future wise, I'm not sure. I mean, honestly, just, just seeing it in a perspective of just um, knowing how in procedural areas, especially because that is the money maker of a hospital is, you know, all these elective surgeries that are being canceled. Like I know one, one doctor, one surgeon, he does 15 cases a day and he's been out of, he hasn't been operating for at least a month and he's probably not going to operate for another month. It's just like, I don't know how the hospitals are going to kind of just give us the nurses a break or even anything a break before it's like business. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the terrifying part because it's like, yeah, we're working, everybody's working. There's some places that are not working, like some areas that are not much work. But it's still, like, like I said, it's just going to be, we still have to make some kind of money. And it's going to look really, really different. And I don't know how we're going to recover from it. And that's going to be an interesting um, situation once the COVID goes away and kind of dwindles down. Like, how are we going to start operating in a normal, quote unquote, way? And how is the, the hospital or the leadership or is going to um, support us? There's definitely a lot of conversations to have as we move forward, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, Dr. H? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I agree with um, what Christina is saying about the, the community around the hospital and in New York City and the support has been like tremendous. Yeah, it, it's, it's really like for me, like I, I was like worried that I'm not, not, not so much about the virus, but Will we have enough compassion for each other? Will we be able to take care of each other through this? Because the virus is going to come. We can't do anything to stop it. We can't, I mean, we, yeah, like you said, we have the um, stay at home uh, initiative. That's like the biggest thing, but, but will we be able to help uh, the people around us, you know, and, and we hear my wife, um, she, she tells me all these stories of people she hears about um, elderly people, not able to get groceries, some people starving in their homes and, the, the community around it is stepping up and, and they're helping each other. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And they, they help out at the hospital too. Like we have like the same kind of thing with them bringing food and, and all that kind of uh, stuff along with the mass donations. And that, that was, you know, that's like really uh, a beautiful thing. And it, it really always like, whenever I see it, it, it's always like, you know, touching to me that, that, people are going above and beyond uh, to be helpful um, and in whatever way. Uh, like I think there was one pizza store that just said, I'm going to just make pizza for hospitals from now on. And that's all he's been doing. Um, and, uh, but as far as you're saying about uh, burnout and what that looks like, there's, or what, what it's going to look like in the future. There was this article on Medscape, um, called U.S. Betrays Healthcare Workers in Coronavirus Disaster. Uh, it's written by uh, the editor there, Eric Topol. And he, he basically was saying that healthcare workers, uh, doctors, nurses, et cetera, they're already um, overstretched. And burnout has already been uh, kind of like an issue going on prior to this. Uh, it, you know, and you hear about all these physician suicides and you hear about residents and, and you know, people in, in various stages of training that just take their own lives because of how uh, brutal it can be. And I think that this, this is not, uh, I hope, I'm hoping this is the, the straw on the camel's back. I mean, it's much more than a straw, right? It's like a huge 
thing, but it's, it was already kind of like a broken system where I think if, if it continued to go like that, we would have to really worry about, um, worry about our physicians because they just, they, there's so much stacked against them. And a lot of the system has, because, because it's a business, uh, this is, this is like the ugly evil side. It's, it's stacked in a way that it'll, it's designed to take advantage of the altruism of physicians, of nurses. When they get short staffed, it's like, oh, can you just take a few more, you know? And you, in, as a physician, you know, in the back of your mind, like this could be risky. I could be um, harming patients if I'm not able to adequately care for all of these patients. But there is that component of not providing enough uh, support from before, from before this this crisis. So I don't know if, if Christina uh, would agree. I mean, sometimes staffing, especially as a charged nurse, I'm sure she always runs into staffing issues, and it, it's it's always kind of running on the fact that nurses will do the right thing by the patient, and doctors will do the right thing by the patient, and you know if there's a shortage. Or if, for whatever reason, uh, one worker gets overstretched, they, it just kind of gets let go. I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Christina? I agree. I mean, I think that staffing is always an issue, period. Um, but at the same time, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, I don't know. Maybe they need to work on their algorithm, but it's always this algorithm that they have that's like, well, we're, we're over staff, we're over staff overstaffed and this is like how in the hell are we overstaffed because I mean I'm sitting here like we have all these patients and we are running like a minimum and you know I you know also, you know I'm a charge nurse now but I was a manager for five years working in the department and that was always the argument it was like how are we overstaffed I work my my nurses to to death like I'm like I feel bad and they're like we you need to cut cut them a little bit more and you know and I don't know like I said I don't know what algorithm that they use but there's an algorithm that they use that is computing all this is like oh well if we have these amount of patients and these doctors can take this and these nurses can take this by this amount like this is the minimal the maximum amount of nurses that we can have to care for all these patients um and the thing is like Patients are not people in numbers. There's different things that you, that you have to deal with, you know, like past medical history, like certain things. And I don't think, you know, uh, numbers, numbers don't work when you're dealing with people. And, you know, that's how I feel about like, yeah. So we're, we are burnt out. I mean, we were burnt out before and we're definitely going to be. Yeah. Burnt. Uh, was, now, Dr. H, was that uh, Medscape you said, the article? Yeah, Medscape, yeah. To yeah, Topol is the author. T O P O L. Make sure that was it. So I'm going to post that in the, the comments for any, anyone who wanted to check that out. So um, we do have someone that has a question for you both, and he also wants to jump in real quick. Um, has relationships with your coworkers have they been different during this time? Uh, have you become more positive? Are you able to freely have? political conversations. Um, I think I believe you guys might be in neighborhoods that might, you know, lean a certain way, but has things become more difficult to speak about or have things become easier? What is the situation with your coworkers? Do you want me to go first? Sure. So, I mean, I think I have a really good rapport with my coworkers, so we kind of freely speak about whatever we need to speak about. Um, one, I will say one instance that I did tell uh, Jarrell about uh, is about discrimination um, within the medical field. Um, and it was just like seeing, seeing that in full force and like actually seeing that like uh, where it, there is uh, a medical per personnel that didn't, what felt like they needed to um, protect themselves beyond measure because of the patient. But then, long story short, the patient was Chinese and there was no indication at that moment that the patient was COVID positive or had COVID, but they felt like they needed to protect themselves 
was very adamant about it, but was not protecting themselves throughout the whole day. And um, had, like, when we told about this and like really one to one, I was like, you know, seeing that kind of discrimination within being a medical first personnel and you see like, oh my God, like, this actually, actually happens. Like people are discriminating regardless, even if, you know, cause we're, you know, we're, we're here to help everybody and anybody, but at the same time, like people are discriminating. Um, and those conversations are difficult to have, you know, um, with that person, of course, cause they're not blatantly saying like, I'm not taking care of this patient because this patient is such and such. But, you know, you have to have a kind of like a, a way to finagle it, just to say, hey, I kind of noticed that you're discriminating, but not say, because then you're like, oh, you're um, Political views, I'm, I'm pretty in a liberal state, so we're kind of like Trump, I guess. So <laughs> that's basically it. Yeah, we might have to ask someone from a different state. That <laughs> um, Dr. H, did you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think as far as like workplace and political views and all that stuff, I mean, it's not any different than any other workplace, you know, like depends on your comfort level with your colleagues. Um, and uh, as as far as like, yeah, so communication with coworkers is really just, just like any other workplace, I think. And uh, the, like if, if we're talking about like political views or like views on the inadequacy of supplies and all that stuff, we, we openly discuss it with each other. And, you know, if, if that does happen um, and, I think in many ways this has made us a lot closer because we were confronted with our mortality and we, and even um, just like everyone is getting sick. I mean, of the healthcare workers and it's, it's, uh, I guess you have compassion for each other as well. And uh, that's, that's kind of the only thing that's really changed. But as far as like discussing uh, our, our thoughts and our beliefs, like we kind of, talk amongst each other we don't really uh like if we have a complaint about something we bring it up to higher ups but uh if nothing happens then we kind of know there's no point in bringing it up again mm -hmm. so there's that yeah um well you know we do appreciate you both for jumping in tonight with us and sharing so openly. Um, I'm sure there are probably a million more questions that we can ask about the details, but I think you guys were able to like really paint a, a vivid picture for us what it's really like to be in the front lines. I know we see a lot of articles and a lot of things and you know, there's a lot of things in the media, but I think um, actually taking the time to speak to someone um, in this kind of way. And I hope you guys have also, um, I hope you, I hope this was helpful for you guys as well. So if there's anything else that you want us to know, or you want the public to know, um, definitely, you know, this is your opportunity to let us know. Um, during this portion, yeah, during, you have a question, Keisha? Yeah, I have a question. Oh. So um, I myself have, I have recovered from COVID-19 and I have a question for the um, medical professionals. Um, is there a risk of reinfection? So this is something actually they're still trying to figure out. I mean, it's really up in the air and uh, it's, it's, it's not even clear if having it once confers immunity for a long time. So you, you have immunity now for, for some time and you know th what it means when these people in in Wuhan have tested again positive I'm trying to understand if that means that they mm -hmm. are still fighting the virus and their body never totally cleared it like maybe there was a point where there was none around but there was still a small quantity and they're continuing to fight it or does that mean that they're getting reinfected or are they asymptomatic carriers? You know, so there's there's so many there's many more questions and there are answers on on that. Um, so you do have some degree of immunity for sure. Um, how long? I don't know. And right. um, can you get it again? Uh, is also still not clear. 
So it's we're so still I'm learning glad, as things are going. I'm glad you jumped in with that. Um, so that actually leads us, and you know, you guys are more than welcome to stay on the line with us as we get into the general discussion portion of this uh, night, um, because like, you may have your own perspective um, as others have their perspective as well. Um, so this morning, I shared an article that they're currently working on an app that will track people who have had COVID. Um, they say that this is a voluntary app. Um, and the way that it would work is that it would basically notify you if you don't have it. Oh, there's someone with COVID near you, nearby. Like it would alert, you will, it would alert you. Like it would be an alarm going off or something. I don't know how that would work exactly. Um, and then this would require people who have COVID to register so that um, they can be assessed to make sure that they're staying six feet apart from others. And so I shared this post um, as I just try to keep adrift of a lot of what's happening out there. And then, um, you know, got a call and was basically told that they're making phone calls asking COVID patients or people who have tested, um, asking very um, interesting questions, um, I would say. And if you're comfortable sharing, you can definitely share that. Um, but do you believe, because you don't know, as you mentioned, Dr. H, that we don't know yet that if people can um, actually be immune to it, if they can catch it again, like, and this question is open to everyone on this call that wants to jump in. If you want to say something, um, definitely, you know, let us know and I'll, I'll meet you. Um, should people be like other things? Should people have to register? Should there be a registry of people who've had it? Is that how things need to start? I mean, that's really the most simplest way of saying it. Um, would you want to know well, how you had it? Yeah, I mean, it, it's if you look at um, what's going on in China, and I don't know like how widespread this is, this information, but they're actually, that's like what they, they have been doing. They've been using WeChat, uh, which is like kind of like the Chinese version of WhatsApp, but they use it for so many other things. It's like Facebook, WhatsApp, all into one. But anyway, um, they use that to track patients. They use that to notify someone, um, you need to self-isolate because you've been exposed. And um, they have like all this AI monitoring everything and algorithms. And the question is like, oh my God, is that like a police state? And, you know, are they like invading too much of our privacy? But it's, it's, it's like, how do we beat this thing? You know, it's, it's so, and they've, and they've opened up and they've gone to some semblance of normal life, um, probably quicker than we will be able to, um, because of our, our response, our sluggish response and, and how widespread it is and how severe it is. Um, but is, is that what it takes to keep this thing down and keep this thing from causing another outbreak? That, that very well may be it. I mean, and it's, 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 it's different for us, you know, because we, we, we're not used to like a police state or like, you know, this idea of like, why does someone else need to know my personal health information? Um, you know, there's a lot of privacy, pri sorry, privacy in healthcare. Um, and, I don't know, it may be that that might be the best way to keep it from spreading and keep it uh, at bay. Otherwise, um, you know, we, I don't, I don't know what to say. Like, I don't know, because of how contagious it is, it's, it's very highly contagious. So it, it, it might be the best way to do it, even if we do lose uh, some privacy in, in uh, you know, people knowing whether we had it or not. And I think um, the stigma is gone at this point. You know, when there were the first few patients, everyone's like, oh, my God, you know, like he has COVID. But now it's, it's like everyone kind of is, is at that level where it, it's becoming more common. So, but, yeah, that's, that's my take on it. Um, thank you. I will say, uh, well, first off, uh, is it key? Yeah. I, don't, I don't want I don't want to, I'm just sorry if I risk this place. But um, I think also with COVID, I felt a lot of speculations that 
there's a lot of speculations that um, it's mutating. So when the virus mutates, you are susceptible and mutating the virus again. It's just like the flu where we kind of like kind of flu uh, mutates, so that we have to be vaccinated and different types of strains. Mm -hmm. um, with the other question, I would say I'm gonna say no, um, just because of the discrimination that's already caused the racism that's already caused and to have an app like that which has caused more racism and discrimination on people and i don't appreciate like i just don't see that being effective like if i'm gonna be walk if somebody especially the people that are scared of getting the covid which is fine i get that but if you're you're going to be positive you're always going to be positive so even if you're going to be asymptomatic someone's going to be like oh my gosh you have covid I don't, I want to stay away from you. And there's going to be some kind of like, there's, there's going to be some kind of hate crime happening because it's already happening already. Mm -hmm. don't even have COVID. I just, Does anyone else want to jump in? Anyone else has another perspective or they want to add something in? Um, yeah. Um, I think if they had something to identify people who had antibodies in their system, that could work. Not something for people who had had COVID because not everybody will understand they had it, they don't have it anymore, but something to show that um, they're now resistant to coronavirus, that, that, would, that could work. I <clears throat> I think this sounds so un-American and I'm saying that specifically as like what this whole place is based on is, you know, freedom for us to kind of do whatever we want. Um, and even outside of how I feel, the idea of uh, going into people's privacy, I love the way they say it. I, I'm getting rid of privacy. I'm not saying that. the privacy of people uh, <laughs> <laughs> would seem like such a, you know, we have people who are, don't even want to self-quarantine right now. I mean, and not even self-quarantine, I mean, uh, just stay home in other cities and states in the country because they don't want to be told what to do, let alone tracked and disclosing information. I think it sounds good. I think, um, you know, and I'm coming from a non-medical place. So I definitely understand the doctor of like, hey, how else are we going to beat this? How else are we going to mm -hmm. get out of this? But I think China is coming from a place where the, the, the government, the regime is already set up for you to do something like that and get everybody on a, one accord. Whereas here, there's going to be a lot of system bucking. And you start telling people they have to register for anything, to tell anybody anything. That's just, again, you know, it's personal perspective. Um, I, don't, I don't, but I don't have any other solutions. So I can't just say, no, that's not the answer. That, it's a dis interesting situation because like, there are people out there that are not honest and are taking this situation and, you know, doing, you know, being irresponsible with it. So it's like, how do you control so many people who may have access, access, whatever that is, that's the word, to this. Um, at the same time, I also have issues with privacy and having, I don't, first of all, I don't want to live, when we go back to normal society, I don't want to live and be checking my phone and jumping every two seconds because someone with COVID just walked past me or something like that. Like, that's crazy. Like, I don't um, did anyone else want to jump in with that specific question? Um, I, think, um, I think what I meant with the antibodies was how we can somehow have like a normal people being public thing after this. Not for right now. Right now, the contact tracing, that's, that's enemy of the state. That's big brother. That's going to be, that'll never go away once they start it, but it's, the only thing you can do now, mm -hmm. I don't even know what the answer is. Um, one thing I just want to say real quick, um, and unfortunately I got to go, uh, but I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to you guys and um, put in my feedback. But um, one thing I saw at a conference, uh, like a conference call between America and China, um, and it, it really struck me. 
uh, what this Chinese doctor said. He said uh, the, the, the American doctor was saying, you know, like back to normal life, back to normal life. And then the Chinese doctor said, there is no more no normal life. There's only 19 life now. And I think that's something that we may have to accept that we have this disease going on and it could, and we don't know like who's going to get sick, who's going to get okay. You know what I'm saying? You know what I, uh, it, it's, it's like, I can have, I can be an asymptomatic carrier, but like, will me being around someone else who's even my age, whatever, are they someone who's more susceptible to becoming like an ICU patient? And then do I want to be that one that gave it to them? Are they going to give it to their grandma? You know what I'm saying? And their grandma might pass because of that. And it, it's, it's, it's just going to be a part of our lives. And it's, it's scary, and it, but it's, it's something that we have to just uh, accept. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately, I have to go. But thank you all. Um, and everyone stay safe. Uh, encourage your family members and, and yourselves to, and, like, your friends to, to, to stay home and kind of quarantine in this time. And uh, if, if they do feel very sick, then definitely come to the hospital. Uh, take care, all of you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much for coming. We really do appreciate it. Thank you for everything you're doing. You're very welcome. Take care. Bye. Okay. Um, so one of the questions that was asked is, and just really, um, we still have Christina on the line, but we also have um, Patrick, and you know, I believe any a lot of people can answer this question. Um, we know that stress and fear can affect the immunity, right? Does anyone have, Christina, do you have any personal advice or anything um, when it comes to dealing with that and confronting mortality? Um, I, I'm really probably not the best person to I like to suppress everything, like, and just ball it. I'm probably not the best person, like, there's this person on, on Zoom that tells me to meditate. I'm still learning, trying to learn how to meditate. But um, I mean, there's a lot of things I know a lot of people have been doing. They've been doing vitamin Cs, you know, elderberry, um, you know, just taking care of themselves, eating healthy, um, meditation, um, stuff like that. Um, also, like, some of that, like, mental health counseling. Um, the, the hospital I work at, they provide EAP. So we have like, you know, and I know a lot of the therapists are doing like telehealth things where they can talk to you via, you know, Zoom or Skype. Um, so that's that that helps. Um, and with my anxiety, yes, I mean, I've just been um, just suppressed things, but that's how I've always been my whole life, which is not a good thing. But, you know, that's why I'm a nurse. <laughs> I, I, t I was telling Jarrell the other day, I was like, this connection is really working for me right now. Like, <laughs> why well, I feel things? Well, I was, uh, you know, I'll jump in there from last week when we had someone speak on these kinds of things, uh, our dear friend. And she was talking about vibration and keeping her vibration high. And to answer that question, too, is like um, reaching out and connecting. Um, Nussi and I really decided to do this because we understood a lot of people in our immediate tribe of Iron Perspective that we created, uh, they would come to our events and now they're not coming to our events, you know, and then on top of the other events that they would frequent to, without thinking about it, you're like, you're getting your juice, you're getting your people filled, you know? And um, I think we were so used to doing that normally that now that we're in the house, we forget to re-up on that, you know? So uh, that was great advice that I got for myself last week, even though we had already started doing this, but uh, to continue to... Uh, okay. okay. Uh, but to continue to, to reach out to your folks and not just your folks, but what Zoom has shown us uh, is that we could have an array of people on a call from east to west and maybe just even sitting in on some of these calls sitting in or if you're getting some zoom uh action from some of your other friends and they're holding spaces and hey we're doing yoga this morning join in 
uh, just to start looking into some of that stuff that we might we, we might be breezing past. Uh, we have a lot more time. And as I mentioned before, like I didn't kind of want to do this right now. I didn't want to do IP stuff. I didn't want to do Netflix and chat and all of that. But <laughs> it has been so therapeutic. Like we, we did Netflix on chat, Netflix and chat on Friday. And uh, it was just a few of us, but man, we talked for like two hours almost, just laughing and chopping it up, discussing a, a movie. And that raised my vibration, you know? And I'm a personal believer that your vibration is tied to your immunity and everything like that. They're all in one. So uh, all that to say is uh, keep reaching out, keep finding a space where people are laughing. If you do your music, I, I had a great, uh, music night last night dj premier and rizza and uh be nice afterwards it was just a night of me in my house dancing and listening to music i loved and i, I felt great so also i don't think anyone has the answers i think this is a very unique time for everybody and everyone's um really thrown in there so even people who are like mental health professionals they're also dealing with their own mental health issues and their own trauma and grief while going through all of this, right? So I think um, even, I think like empathy for everyone in every position, I don't think, I think a lot of times we're always looking for like gurus or someone else to tell us like how it's supposed to be or what can be done or what should be done when I think um, we kind of get to figure that out as a society as for yourself. Um, because who knows what the answer is? It could look differently for different people, right? So some people want to, like, I think what DJ Nice did, I, we kind of brought this up a little bit last week, um, by him starting this whole DJ dance revolution. For a lot of people, that's something that really spoke to them. For a lot of people, especially extroverts, like, they want to be doing something on Saturday night. So dancing and music is something that helps. Other people might not. That might not be their thing. It might be a Netflix watching movie, right? We have people who show up to our um, Netflix and chat that might not want to come to this conversation here today because it's too heavy for them. Um, like, so we have to recognize that there's different kinds of levels and different people are going to be able to handle different things. So. Keisha says med meditation has been helping with her anxiety. Yeah. So that came up a few times. <clears throat> Yeah, um, I just um, been meditating at least 10, 15 minutes a day um, in the morning to ground me, as well as just doing things that I, you know, enjoy, um, reading books, um, you know, talking to family and friends, um, and just keep it, trying to keep my vibration high, which is where the meditation helps a lot, um, as well as I'm a spiritual person. So um, when... I had originally was, um, you know, assessed and diagnosed with COVID-19. I started praying Psalm 91 um, and lighting white candles, but that's what works for me. It may not be work for someone else, but, you know, figure out whatever it is that can bring you some calm and peace and just do more of that. I love the, I love the Zoom head nods. <laughs> yes. And I think um, someone said, like, this, there has to be a lot of grace during all of this because we're going to have moments. We're going to have higher moments. We're going to have lower moments. Um, and they're all okay, you know, so. Um, Christina, any suggestions? Now you already got all my suggestions. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Push it down. Laughter, laughter, <laughs> laughter. Yes, <laughs> laughter has been a go-to so much for this. That's a great point. Yes. Yes. Um. So I know we just had a heavy um, conversation with Dr. H and Christina, um, and so we don't have any specific questions like prepared. Really, in terms of, we really wanted to just give them a space to share their experience and their perspective. Um, is there anything that came up for you guys while listening to them speak? Um, what are some of the personal feelings or thoughts that came up while you were listening? If anyone wants to share. For me, um, 
anatomy of um, acute care and the rehab and how you can always tell, like everybody on the floor can tell like a day or two before, oh yeah, they're, they're heading down. Yeah, they're on their way out, they're heading down. And it'll be like subtle things, but um, yeah, I forgot about that until you mentioned, you know. And what I heard about COVID is it's very fast. It's not like what, what would be in a normal patient, like two, three days of them heading down in a COVID person, it could be like six, six hours. Like during a shift, they go from pretty stable to is that right or? Yeah. Um, yeah, you're absolutely correct. I mean, um, there was a patient, she got extubated and she was doing really well and then got re-intubated, um, which is like basically a tube down to help with breathing. And, you know, it's just like stuff like that. Um, patients, you know, they're coming into the emergency room, they're, they can't breathe and, you know, they get to get resuscitated. And, you know, depending on how quickly they get resuscitated, you know, and if they're getting enough oxygen, you know, it's either yes or no. Um, so it's just really a lot of things. And there was a huge thing about there's not enough ventilators. And that's a thing too, because you need to have ventilators to keep people breathing. Um, and there's a certain um, setting that they have to be in that is helping because the, the, it's attacking their, their respiratory system in a, in a way that I don't think anybody has ever seen they haven't um and it's just like the way that their settings are is just totally different to you like when i was talking to a respiratory therapist and they're like amazing. and i was like well what are their settings and they're just like and they're basically like they're they have to breathe out more they have to breathe out more than taking in where normally we're breathing in longer and then uh, um I mean, exhaling faster it's the opposite I mean, just, Wait, you said they have to breathe in more than they breathe out? Normally we inhale and we're inhaling a lot, like, you know, a longer. Yeah. And then we exhale quicker. So it's the inverse of that. So they have to exhale, like, like longer and inhale quicker so they can pull, pull off the CO2. So it's just, it's a very, and like, that's how they have to change their vent settings. So it's a, wow. yeah, it's a, different type of beast. Wow. Can I, what's that face? She said different type of beast too many times. <laughs> <laughs> I, keep it real. I keep it 100. Jarell knows I keep it 100. That, just, just push the anxiety down. Just, yeah. You know, it's gone. You know, you should, you should, like, I would like to keep with people when they ask, when, like, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people, like, if, if things are not too terrible, I'll be like, oh, it's okay, it's all right, just kind of just wash it off. But if this is bad, this is bad, like, I'm, like, this is bad, like, just, like, yeah, this is, this is, this is a different type of people, like, and, and we had this conversation and had Christina and Dr. H on specifically um, for our community, the people who are going to see this. Uh, we're, we're big on positivity. We don't want to spread fear. This is already fearful enough. But I think there is a part of our community that needs to know that this is a different beast. That mm -hmm. this is not just something that's, so, uh, you know, like this is really going to change the landscape of humanity. And how many times do we say that in life, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, it's really affecting our communities. And yeah, and it's affecting our communities yeah. and our delay as like a country, it has shown what it yeah. does, but then it, our delay within our communities is starting to show the number disparity. Um, and it's just not something that it's just like this black cloud that we can't avoid and it's just going to kill everybody. It's, it's just that it's very real and we can curb, uh, you know, flatten the curve or whatever, but we, we need to address what the thing is, you know, and mm -hmm. people need to know how. Mm -hmm serious it is yeah. what are what are the best things that you've seen um people do at home to treat you know like mild symptoms keep them from getting severe because i know they were saying for at least I, I i get it and i i've been telling people don't take ibuprofen or leave take tylenol um make sure that you hydrate plenty 
first sign of symptoms, take some medication, you don't want to have a fever at all. So the second you start feeling fever, Tylenol on a regimen. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that too. It's just hydrating, um, you know, getting enough rest, getting enough nutrition, um, and that, you know, you self isolate yourself. If you're living with your family, to self isolate yourself um, so that people, you know, people don't um, get it. And also just being clean and hygienic. If you're using the bathroom, make sure you're cleaning everything um, after you leave or have somebody like come in and do it in a way that they're protecting themselves um, because it's apparently reports that the virus is a very heavy virus. So it's on surfaces for a very long time and um, like for I think a week. So you want to just like you clean your surface you have, like, there's a suspect, uh, you suspect there's COVID. Thank and you. When, you uh, it, we, this, the biggest to me, um, when is it time to go to the hospital? Respiratory um, I, I, Respiratory, um, because you can't do anything about that at home. Um, if you're having trouble breathing, I know people that like they have trouble breathing and they're unable to speak. If you aren't able to speak two words or a sentence without having to cough or having to catch your breath, you really should go to the hospital because you know it could get worse. And there's nothing you can do at home to help at all. Like this is like you need oxygen, you need medical support, you need oxygen. You might need to, you might need like a nebulizer treatment. These are things that you don't have at home regularly. That's a great question. Thank you. Yes. So last week we had an opportunity to kind of get into discussion about um, what it looks like to support from home. And we have a few different initiatives here at I Am Perspective that we are working on. Um, one of them is um, creating a video project kind of um, really at the suggestion of Dr. H when he kind of came to me the first time. And I didn't have something that I could actually like, I didn't have a real answer or a solution for him of how to reach more people in a different kind of way. And so um, we are currently working on something. We do have a Facebook group going. Um, this week has been a little bit um, hectic. There's been a lot of things that have been happening on all different ends. Um, we've been having a diff two different events ourselves, um, but we do plan on um, executing this video sooner than later. So if you guys are interested in joining this group, I will add you guys to the group. Um, and there, we have a few other initiatives that we're looking to take as well. Um, we will not be doing our Netflix and chat next week um but we will be back the following week and wow. for those of you and i think anyone who's on the line right now we do have a special event on wednesday um celebrating our birthday and so we are gonna have but <laughs> what no key with that you know. i hear you i don't know what he said um so that's gonna be on wednesday <laughs> wednesday i don't like yeah um We'll have details out for that soon and a flyer and everything as well. Um, if there's any topics that you guys are interested in hearing about specifically, um, any angles or any perspectives that you guys want us to you know, touch on, definitely let us know. We're always open to that. Um, this Tuesday, we have our episode 13 coming out of our radio show where we will, where we have interviewed our, some of our other non-essential, other essential workers. Um, particularly in the MTA, um, the airline industry, and the restaurant industry. So um, that's on Tuesday. Um, and yeah, definitely stay in, stay in tune. If you guys are not following us already, follow us on our Instagram um, and see what else we have in store for you guys during this time. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Um, as I mentioned before, we're, we're in this like you. 
you all. I know we're we're leading this conversation right now, but we're very much in the house, like everybody. So um, we're 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 just trying to continue to create a space for people and to see how this looks. Share good information as well. Sometimes it's good to just get up and chat and kick it, and that's what we're doing on Fridays with our with our Netflix thing. Sometimes it's good to get deep and share some real perspectives and information like we're doing tonight. Um, yeah. So, uh, and we'll celebrate. Sometimes it's time to celebrate. So we're gonna celebrate for Nussie and um, this week. So we'd love for everybody to be for that, be there for that too. We're gonna have tambourines. Um, that's the first thing I'm saying. <laughs> if I'm leading off with that, just imagine what this thing is gonna be. Like. <laughs> No, like you said, you know, laughter, fun. We need to see each other. We need to see each other's faces more. Um, and that goes for us. That goes for our families, for the people that just make us smile in this time. So um, we're going to keep pressing on and keep doing these events, keep bringing people together, couch to couch, in bed, bed to bed and everything. And thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much.